So no TV trivia this week. I'm sorry. I can only, you know, there's only so much that I can do that. Uh, you'll have to go online to at least hear some of the reactions and things. Uh, but we started a series last week about the book of fill in the blank. The book of well, someone said it, James. All right, we call it Family Matters. I'm calling it Episode Two. There's that little. There's who had that TV? The exact TV. Someone did. You remember that sound? Clunk clunk when you change the stations. Um, let me give you a, a little bit what we're going to probably do every week because James is a letter, um, not unlike many of the letters in the New Testament. And again, I, I'm using the TV and family TV show analogy, but oftentimes when you watch a show, they would you know do last time or do a quick little recap. And sometimes you're grateful for that. Um, and what, what's been happening. And we're going to do that each week with James because we're going to have to take a couple steps back because usually there's a congruent thought going through a, like maybe 25 verses. So I sometimes have to back up for us to move forward. So bear with me. And if you're jumping in for the first time, you'd be like, I have no idea. I didn't see that one. So it'll be up there on YouTube soon. Uh, we're a little bit behind, but please, I do encourage you not, not just, you know, we're not breaking the internet in terms of views, but it helps that you're caught up on a series if we're in a series. Uh, you can listen to it on podcast. You can listen to it uh, on YouTube in the background, just so you know where we are each week. And so James is the physical brother of Jesus. Okay, I know that last week some people were like, "Oh, really? Yeah." Uh, Mary had and Joseph had other children after Jesus, and James is one of those brothers. We discovered last week that many of uh, Jesus' siblings did not believe in him of who he was at first. We covered that last week. And so this is a broad kind of pastoral letter. It's not like Paul who would write to a specific church. James was writing more to churches all over the place. And that's why it's easier sometimes to translate to our time because it's open and broad like that. And, and again, I'm using the family analogy because obviously James is in the family of Jesus, literally. And we use that term, as you already heard this morning. We use that term. If, if you don't realize when you walk in this room, it says family room. All right, and that's an intentional thing that we did, and we believe that within a church. And so these are family matters when you're reading a book together as a, as a church, because there's things within the family that sometimes they're going to get addressed, and we need to address them. Anyone ever have a family meeting in their home? All right, all right. If, you don't, if you're not raising your hand, then you probably, it's probably time. It's probably time that you need to have a family meeting, all right? And, all, and usually the children are like, oh, great. But we have good family meetings sometimes. We've had family meetings of like, all right, what's the bucket list for the summer? What, what do we want to do? We don't always accomplish them, but it's sometimes good to like have a good family meeting where it's not just like we're addressing an issue, like we're planning something fun and we want to make sure that everybody's input is there. So it doesn't always mean it's bad. And so uh, we covered a, la- a couple of things last week. We talked about trials, facing trials and testing. The perseverance leads to maturity and this idea of completeness. And we need to persevere in our faith. Remember, you don't just slap these verses on to some arbitrary thing going in your life and say, oh, I, you need to persevere. Uh, this is ultimately about persevering in our faith, not just anything in life. Yes, you could apply certain things, but this is about faith. And then he ended talking about wisdom and doubting and, and that, 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 that tension within doubting. I'll give you the verses here. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. And here's how we, I mean, I didn't define these, but here's how the Bible defines these words. Believe means faith, trust, confidence, persuasion. And I love this uh, kind of exposition of this, God's divine persuasion. Therefore, distinct from human belief or confidence, yet involving it. And so there's this mashup, right? Like God gives us this ability to have faith and believe, but yet we have a part to play in that too. So it's almost like this combining of those forces. God is giving us faith and sometimes increasing our faith, but then we need to respond in our faith. And sometimes that revolves around an action, doing something, not just saying, yes, I believe. I believe in God. You know, the Bible actually says that the demons believe in God. Like that, that belief in and of itself uh, is not anything much to say. And so we talked about this battle uh, of, of things within our life. The first one is subjective feelings, right? We have feelings sometimes. The feelings can sometimes dictate how we feel, right? And then we say, oh, I don't, I'm not feeling it today. I don't, whoever said this, I don't feel like it, right? 
And if that's being told to you, you say, I don't care how you feel. You need to clean your room, right? All right, so we can't let feelings just dictate us. And, and so we, feelings get in, in a battle against the world's ideas, right? What people are saying, what, what the culture is saying, what, what the, we assume the majority of people, I know friends, I, everyone's doing this or that, I'm not sure. And then there's this other part here versus God's word, all right? And so this is really important. This is where doubt can start to come in when these are all battling for the first position in our life. And here's how the, the Bible des- describes doubt. And to distinguish, discern one thing from another, to hesitate, to waver, literally judging back, and which can either positively refer to close reasoning or negatively overjudging, going too far. Maybe you've heard this word vacillating, right? Going back and forth. I'm not Sure. One day it's sunny and I think God loves me. The next day it's cloudy and I'm not so sure. Anyone ever been there? Right? That's your feelings getting in there. Right? Then, that, that, then, then something comes across your feed and someone says, oh, you know what? God doesn't exist. And here's the five reasons why. Blah, 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 blah. And you're like, oh, yeah. You know what? I don't know. And then it starts to create this tension with us. And these things will down into all areas of our life. And so James is going to go right in the next thought and address an area where this double-mindedness can take place. Look at James chapter 1, verse 9. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossoms fall, its blossom falls, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Now, actually, just a few weeks ago, we covered this story of the rich young ruler within Scripture. Uh, and, and so we understood, right, that even that, that parable isn't this so much about money, but about our heart and what might be distracting our heart and keep it, keeping us in the way of following Jesus. And so even here, right, someone could say, well, I'm too poor to do anything for, for, for Jesus. And someone could say, well, I'm too rich to do anything for Jesus because I, I, I got stuff I got to do. And so this double-mindedness can start to take place in all different ways. Faith versus doubt. Works versus grace, right? Oh, I got to earn this. And like, whoa, we just, we just sang our hearts out saying your grace is enough. Well, which one is it? There's that tension. Poor versus rich. So I want you to understand this is what James is touching on. So it's a big theme, but it's connected to the verses we already covered last week. But money and status mean nothing in the kingdom of God. He's, God's not caring, really, what, where, where that's at. He will use maybe those, but he's not concerned. He's like, oh, okay, well, you know, yeah, you have an excuse one way or the other not to do something for me. You know, too rich, too poor, whatever it may be. Here's a, another uh, literal, it says, it says this, one of the commentaries says, lift up the poor believers now, require the rich believers to humble themselves. This is the intent of what James is saying. So don't put too much weight in status or things. Jesus actually addresses this in Matthew. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Anyone ever have a moth? eat something in your closet. I believe recently I put on a suit and we don't know what it was, but I had like holes in my suit and I was like, but I also had a friend growing up that his, his parents were mothball fanatics. And my, my, my parents actually used to call him as a joke mothball because he would just reek of mothballs. But I guess they didn't have moths in their clothes. I don't know if that's the payoff, but there you go. He goes on to say this, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Right? Jesus is getting to the heart of things. Like, it doesn't matter all this stuff. We put so much, so much effort sometimes, right, at building our kingdom here and it's not going to last. And he's saying where your heart really is, where your treasure really is, that's what's going to show. And so here's what these words mean. This is important. Even here, poor and rich. Poor means humble or lowly in position or spirit, and sometimes in a good sense. So poor doesn't necessarily mean like, oh, I'm reaching a certain economic level. It could just be 
uh, in the state of, of where you are. Now, rich is a little different, abounding in, wealthy, or fully resourced. And so he's making this differentiation here. And so here's two other verses that talk about kind of echoing what James is saying. Matthew and Proverbs. Matthew 23, 12 says, For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. God's always looking at the heart of the person. No matter where you are, right? Sometimes he'll need to humble you. And sometimes if you're humbled already, he will exalt you because it's God doing it. It's not us doing it. Now we're fighting for position, trying to be known, trying to make enough money to, to keep up with the Joneses. Who are the Joneses, right? But there's always someone in our life. We're trying to reach that bar. And then Proverbs says this, the wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it a wall too high to scale. Come on, we've been there too. And maybe that wall doesn't seem too high, but when we have a certain amount of money in the bank account, what do we do? We feel good, right? We feel okay. But when it starts to dip, we start to get nervous. And that's where even that double-mindedness can start to happen. Okay, God. Oh, no. Something's happening. Um, It's it's getting lower and lower. And and now I'm getting worried. Are you really there, God? Are you going to show up? And we base it on that. And God's like, I don't care about money. I don't care about status. That doesn't matter to me. You can still do great things for me. Don't get, don't get being pulled back and forth like that. James is going to go on. He already used this imagery. I don't know if you caught it there. Uh, and if, if something that they were familiar with. Pastor Joe wrote this up on Wednesday night, that often the Bible writers will use imagery and, and pictures that they would understand. All right? I don't think we would understand it fully. Right? Uh, if, if ladies or, or gentlemen, if you love flowers, you usually don't have the problem of putting them out and by midday, they're withered and dried and gone. But think about context here. In the Middle East, that's very relevant, right? A flower could be coming up, and what happens? It's windy, it's hot, it's arid, and that flower can wither and die within the same day. And he's using this picture like that's how quick it can come, right? We think we're secure. We think we got it. All right, we got enough in the bank account. And then what happens? The oil burner breaks, the car breaks down, something comes up, and then there's things, and then suddenly, whew, it's gone. And, the, and what we are putting our faith in, what we're putting our hope in, that's gone. People who put their, uh, their faith in money and possessions. But you know, it's interesting. James actually, I'm going to go back here because I want you to see it. And James tells us to do something, which is Interesting. James uh, verse 9 says, Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. Right? Uh, some, some versions actually say the word boast. So we're usually told not to boast, right? But this is a case where James actually says, go ahead. And here's what he's telling you to boast in. Look at what Jeremiah says about this. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches, but let the one who boasts boast about this. All right, so if you ever wanted to boast, here's what we're allowed to boast about. That they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for in these I delight, declares the Lord. This is the only boasting allowed. You want to boast? Jesus is in my life. Jesus, I know him, right? Oh, it's coming. Uh, it's already coming. It's a little too early to talk about Christmas, right? But that, there's an elf quote right there. I know him. All right, you're welcome. Okay, that's way too early for Pastor Keith, all right? I have strict rules about that, but it just came out, all right? But think about that. That's the thing we can boast in. I know Jesus, Right? I, I, I can't boast about anything else. My bank account might change. My status in this world might change, but I know Jesus. And James is reminding us whether, whether we find ourselves lowly, and again, being rich isn't bad. He's not saying that. He's just saying, don't take pride in that. Don't, don't, don't think that that's going to be the thing that gets you through. But you can boast in the Lord. You can say, you know what? The Lord's got me. I know him. We have a relationship. No matter what position you find yourself in life, how are you handling it regarding matters of faith? What are you doing with the natural pushback? And this is what the book of James is about. And again, this, this is even, I mean, I, I love to think about this, but, you know, James was an unbeliever, you know what I mean? In every sense of the word, like, no way, not my brother, <laughs> like, no way, right? And then he gets convinced, and, and he's facing the natural pushback of following Jesus. And he's encouraging the church then and encouraging the church now. There's going to be natural pushback 
that happens when you start to really follow Jesus. Amen? You're going to find it when you start stepping out and living God's truth, not just talking it, which is important, but actually doing it. And someone says, why are you doing that? Or why are you not doing that? And then you're going to have to give an explanation. Oh, well, I, I'm a Christian. And, and here's why. You know? And sometimes that challenges us when we say, I don't know why. Why am I doing this? Why am I not doing this? It makes us dig in. Many things will creep up to replace that number one position in our heart, in our life. That's supposed to be the Lord. But many things will be fighting for that every day. Don't think that they rest. They're like, oh, okay, you Jesus in your life? All right, we'll back off. Right? Every day they will be fighting and vying for that position. This is a battle sometimes, but we need to know how to fight it. Second Corinthians says this. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. How many people are grateful for that? All right? Because it would be easier to just jump in and do what everybody else is doing. All right? I'm going to fight back the same way. All right? You insult me, I'm going to insult you right back. But this is bigger and deeper than that. This is also an internal struggle. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Did you ever have to do this? Did you ever have to have the war inside here? All right. It starts to happen like, oh, I'm I'm wrestling with this and I'm fighting with this. Faith over fear. Right. Truth over lies. What do I do, Lord? How how do I handle this? What, What does your word say? I'm confused. Lies. Doubt. Fear. Stress, your past, opinions, circumstances, pain. All of these things sometimes have to come under under obedience to Jesus. And what does he say about those things in our life? Personally and culturally, prayer is powerful. This is the context of this verse, right? Do you understand like the early church was facing the ultimate pushback where people were literally being killed for their faith? Oh, you're following Jesus? Uh Uh-oh, no, no, no. That's not going to happen, right? Right? And so they are literally fighting against this. And I'm sure they wanted just to argue. And not that they didn't. Paul was positioned many times through what? Prison, beatings, shipwrecked, all of these things. But God kept positioning him in front of people of high uh, stature and in and society and leadership. And having Paul explain things. Talk about the Lord. And oftentimes they were like, oh, thank you. Back to prison. You know, they didn't just change immediately. But that was impacting things. Are we ready to do that? Who's signing up? All right, let's all go to jail together. Ready? No altar call today. The police are coming. Right? That, that's not what you're going to put on your social media. Come to service today. You're probably going to be arrested. Right? That, that would not be the thing that we would even think about. Yet, what happens in our life? There is natural pushback when we start to follow Jesus. And as soon as we get that, what do we start to do? Whoa, back and forth. I'm not sure if I should follow Jesus. This is a little too much. I don't want to be one of those holy rollers. I don't, I don't want to be one of those. So I'm going to look radical. So, you know, I'll just, I'll go to church every once in a while. I'll just pick up my Bible when things get really tough. I, I, I'll, I'll wait, you know. I'll be a CEO Christian. Christmas and Easter only. Come on. Some of you were that before you came here. All right. You, you, you did your time. All right. Okay. Yep. I'm, I'm in. I'm out. Hope that. Priest or pastor talks quick because I got stuff to do. I'm going to go long today, extra long. Here's what I encourage you to do. I said, I ended before saying prayer is powerful, right? What does it say? We have divine power to demolish strongholds. Why? By going out there with our sword of the spirit and knocking someone in the head? No, pray. Pray. Do you believe that? Do you believe prayer is powerful? I do. And is it a struggle sometimes? Absolutely. Is it a struggle to get here for Wednesday on time? Absolutely. Is it a struggle to to sacrifice? Pastor Keith, Saturday might be the only day I can sleep in. Okay. I get it. I've been there too. Is it going to be worth it? But we have no problem if I went around this room and say, tell me something terrible that's going on in our world, in our town, in your life. We, have, we can complain. Good. Aren't we good at complaining? That's not a spiritual gift, but we're good at it, right? Some of us have no problem. Oh, I can tell you a list of things that are wrong. We have divine power to demolish strongholds, demolish arguments, and every pretension that sets itself against the knowledge of God. Whew. 
That sounds pretty powerful, right? That sounds exciting. That, that, that means this. Pray for elections. Okay? Pray. Hello? That, that's an amen, right? Amen? All right? And not, not just, oh, God, this is what I want. God, what do you want? Pray for schools. Are you praying for our schools? Pray for our schools. Do you realize that, that students and teachers and administrators are influencing a generation after generation all over this world? Pray for our schools. Doesn't mean they're perfect. I know that, so let's pray. Pray for our neighbors. Oh, but you don't know my neighbor. Trust me, I get it. Pray. Pray for our family, our friends, our kids. Sometimes you need to have a spiritual pep talk with your own soul because you can start to doubt. You can start to be double-minded and be like, well, I don't know, and, 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 and back and forth, back and forth, right? It gets tiresome. Look what Psalm 42 says. This is David. He's talking to himself. You can do it now. You have Bluetooth. It doesn't matter. No one will know. You can do it in the car. No one thinks it's weird anymore. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Sometimes we need that spiritual pep talk. Like, okay, all right, hold on. Stop everything. I need God's word. I need to focus. I, I need to get my head straight here. Because I, what I talked about last week, that, that idea of being on the, on the sea, if, you, if anyone's prone to seasickness, you know what happens when you're seasick. You cannot function, right? Besides turning green, <laughs> you can't function. You can't do anything. You're just like, leave me alone. And doesn't that happen spiritually sometimes? We just get to a place where you're like, I don't know. I don't know. Leave me alone. I, I just, I, I don't know what's going on. I don't, I'm not sure. Things are, seem out of control. Why, are you, why, my soul, are you so downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. This is David talking to himself. This is why worship is so important and powerful. I, I pray that it happens more than just on a Sunday morning when we do it. Reminding my soul of God's truth, his character, his action. I'll give you a couple examples because I think these are all appropriate. I know there might be arguments about worship and different things, and we can have them, and that's fine. But sometimes there's songs that are just talking to God, right? I put it in parentheses, maybe a song you've, you've heard that we do here. Thank you, Jesus, right? I'm just talking to God. Thank you, Jesus. You set me free, right? I'm just talking directly to God. I'm just thanking him. And there's songs talking about God. How great is our God, right? I'm just singing about him. And that's important, right? My soul needs to hear how great <laughs> is our God. Sometimes it's just proclaiming beliefs. Every giant will fall. Right? We've, we sang that. That's one of Pastor Keith's favorites because I know those four chords. All right? <laughs> but I love the words in it. Right? I'm a word guy. I, I, the words to me are powerful. All right? So if you come to me and say, oh, I don't listen to lyrics. All right? You're lying to yourself because you do. All right? Whether it's Christian music, but especially when it's not Christian music, those words are getting into your soul. Side note, I didn't even write that in my notes. So be careful, little ears, what you hear. All right? Because that will get in there. And I know, I'm, I love music. Doesn't mean I, and I'm not proclaiming only listen to Christian music. I'm just saying be aware. There are messages that are subtle. There are truths that are subtle, and it will get into your soul. But that's why worship music is so powerful. All of these are necessary. Talking to God, talking about God, proclaiming our beliefs together. That's supposed to encourage our soul so we're not so double-minded. Like, no, no, I sang God's truth today. I know that's God's word. No, yes, I'm going to proclaim that. And you know what the greatest thing is? I used to do this when I was a teenager and I went back in my notes. I, I would be going through the Bible and, and I was encouraged that as a young man, I've been good about journaling sometimes and bad about journaling, writing just stuff down. Again, I, it, there's no wrong way to do this except by not doing it in some way, shape, or form. I encourage you. When you read your Bible, so I used to take notes, and I would write, oh, this, this verse is from a song. And as I see the other way around, <laughs> this song was taken from the Bible. But I would see something and be like, oh, that, that's a verse. You know? And, and like, that's encouraging when you get God's word in you. When you and we have no excuse now. Listen, there's, there's a genre for you that's going to worship the Lord, all right? Back in the 80s, not so much, all right? <laughs> there wasn't a lot to choose from, and there was no Pandora and Spotify. You can find any genre of Christian music, and if you're not sure, ask Alex. He'll find something for you. Between me and Alex, we will find a genre of music for you. It's so important. 
to worship the Lord. I know sometimes I need that. I need to just stop everything, and I, I need to just worship the Lord. Sometimes that's just being in the presence of God and stopping everything. Here's how James, we're going we're gonna to start to wrap up a little bit. I'm giving a, a bite size here. Last week we covered a big bite. This is a little bit smaller. And next week we're going big again because there's some big thoughts here. But here's how he wraps up this part or how I'm going to wrap it up this morning. Blessed is the one who perseveres, right? There's that trial and testing language again. Under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So this battle of double-mindedness is sometimes a test too, that God's testing to see the genuineness of, of our heart, right? He's allowing that testing to happen. We covered a lot of that last week. It's not that God's giving us a, a final exam and saying, all right, you better get the answers right. He's giving us opportunity. He's allowing things to happen in life sometimes to show the genuineness of it. And we covered this last week, right? We're very glad that surgeons take tests, right? We wouldn't be like, oh, no, that's too much. Just let them through. It's fine, right? And so we, what does it do? Hopefully, it's making them more, more mature and more complete. What happens when testing happens in our life as a Christian? The goal of what Scripture says, more mature and more complete in Jesus. Are we finding, oh, more and more that I need Jesus? Wow, Jesus is, is who I need to get through life. This word persevere is, is so important. Remaining under of the load. Sometimes that, right? We want, Jesus, rescue me. Get me out of this. And he's like, no, I'm going to help you walk through it. I'm walking here alongside of you, but I'm going to have you, help you persevere. Other times, he grabs us out and puts us somewhere else. Amen? But realize there's times where he wants us to persevere because he's, he's training maybe a spiritual muscle inside our body that we haven't used in a while. Did anyone want to ever do that physically? Right? And that's used our excuse. Oh, what did I do? I must have never used that muscle before because it hurts now. Right? And that, that's what happens spiritually, right? We step out in faith and we're like, oh, I feel spiritually sore. Like, that was tough. I don't want to do that again. And God's like, no, I want you to persevere. I want, I want you to bear up, endure. For the believer, this, is uni this uniquely happens by God's power. We're not doing it in our own strength. Do you ever come out of a situation on the other side and you're like, I don't know how I did that. That was God. That was God's grace. That was God's mercy. That was God's protection. But man, I, I'm coming out the other side. Doesn't mean I don't have scars. Doesn't mean I didn't learn a lesson. Doesn't mean it wasn't hard. But man, I'm on the other side. Okay, Whew, my head's above water again, God. I, I, I got there. And God's like, I'm showing you that there's perseverance that you need sometimes within me when you stay connected to me. Will you let God help you persevere? Because that's usually when we run, right? The first time we face opposition, the first time it gets tough. And again, I've been a pastor for a long time, and I've watched people do that, right? They come, and they're all excited. We did it this morning, right? Jesus set me free. Oh, man, his grace is wonderful. And then next Tuesday, something happens, and they're like, okay, I'm good. I'm done. I tried it. I tried the Jesus thing. I'm good now. I'm like, wait, <laughs> hold on, right? There, there's got to be some perseverance. And it doesn't mean the trial and the testing will magically go away. I don't, that, that would be unscriptural for me to tell you that. Sometimes it doesn't go away. But you'll be more complete and mature on the other end. And you'll have confidence regardless of your position in life. Whether you feel like, man, I feel lowly today. I feel like I, I, I'm in a poor spot in my life right now. James says, take pride. Boast about the Lord. Oh, but everything's great. My bank account's full. The days are sunny. I'm on vacation. <laughs> Boast in the Lord, because he's the one who allowed that to happen. He's in control no matter what. Still have to persevere. I'm going to wrap up with a quote from the commentary. It says, what James is suggesting then is that the Christian must practice steadfastness in order to achieve a settled, steadfast character. Oh, man, isn't that, a, isn't that an awesome description? Of, I, I want that. I want to have a settled, steadfast character, all right? That people see, like, wow, like, you're, you're okay when you go through stuff. Yep, I'm settled. I, I'm steadfast. I'm just continuing consistent. The waves aren't knocking me off. And, and, and that's character, right? That's God building the character in me. It says, as the athlete endures bodily stress, in order to achieve a high level of physical endurance, 
So the Christian is to endure the trials of life in order to attain the spiritual endurance that will bring perfection. Remember, perfection doesn't mean I don't ever do anything wrong. There's this completeness that we'll never fully grasp, we'll never fully achieve, but we're growing in it. And there's areas where we surrender to God. You know what? I used to always struggle in this area. But man, you know what? Jesus has, has helped me deal with that issue now. That area of my life, I've really put under his lordship and he takes care of that. But I'm still struggling with this area of my life. Anyone ever been there? Right? We're still growing in that perfection, still growing in that completeness. We're like, yep, Jesus has got this, but I'm still struggling giving him this. But I want to, and I'm giving him a box a day until that room is emptied and then he can have full control. I think that's okay. And again, I'm not talking about sin, all right? Jesus, better clean house if there's sin in your life. That needs to be taken care of. Don't, don't play around with that. These are areas of control. I'm going to end with a verse that I love, but I'm going to put it in context. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. So important, again, to read certain things in context. It says this, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Right? I think we understand reaping and sowing. Uh, it's, it's this agri- agricultural like picture. All right? We plant something. We water it. It's going to grow. And many of us know that. It might not grow overnight. But if you are watering something in your life that is destructive, that is sinful, and you might be like, oh, it's just a little bit here. It's just a little bit there. Right? It will grow, and it will eventually be destructive. But at the same time, in a good way, you might not feel like there's a lot of growth. Oh, I just watered a little bit here. I just prayed on a Sunday morning. I just came to a Wednesday night Bible study. I just started to get consistent in my devotions. But I don't feel like anything's happening. Come on. Who's been there? I don't feel like anything's happening. Keep watering. Keep sowing those seeds. Keep allowing the Lord to do that. Keep showing up to those opportunities. You know what happens when someone misses church? Okay, and I'll be the first to admit it. I've missed church before. I'm usually somewhere else. I'm not just sitting home. If I am, please come to 17 Tucker's Lane and come get me. All right, if I'm just sitting home, like, hey, I don't feel like coming today. All right? Because I've wanted to do that to some of you. <laughs> But what happens? You miss once, it's easier to miss twice. It's easier to miss another time. And no one called me from that church. Nobody cares. I'm good. I I can be a Christian by myself. Right? I I don't see anywhere in Scripture that says otherwise. I'm good. I'm good. I don't need I don't need church. Well, church needs you. This is this is part of the how we grow. This is part of the kingdom business that happens here. Yes, there are things that you need to do individually. Please do them because it impacts what we do corporately. And it helps or hurts. And so let's, let's keep sowing and then we get to reap. And it goes on. We're not done. We're getting to the verse that I love to say. Here it is. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You think nothing's happening? Oh, it's happening. It's happening under the surface. There's things growing. Trust the Lord. Trust the process. Because at the right time, poof, there's going to be breakthrough. And we're going to be like, oh, something's growing. Something's growing. Oh, wow. There it is. And those roots are, are going to be growing deep. And God's pre- preparing you for something that you thought, oh, th- this isn't really happening. This is, this, is, this is a waste of my time. I should show up to pray. I prayed and nothing happened. I have heard that story so many times. What if, and, I, and this is just my own thinking, you prayed 99 times and God's like, just get to 100, breakthrough's coming, and you're like, I'm done. I'm not going to pray about that anymore. God's like, well, wait, there was something under the surface that was growing. It was amazing. I was getting you set up for this amazing breakthrough. And you just give up. Persevere. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have every opportunity, let us do good to all people. All people. All people. All means, oh, very good. What wise people you are. Especially to those who belong to the family of believers. You can't do good to the family of believers if you're not spending time with them. You can't, 
You can't spend time, you can't do good to the family of believers if you're not growing as a family. And this is why family matters. Family matters, and there are family matters. <laughs> Catch my tone there, right? And it matters. And so we're reading the book of James together. So here's how I want to end this morning. I'm going to close in prayer, and then I'm going to encourage you. If you're in a, in a situation, and it might be just everyday stuff. It might not be anything groundbreaking. You'd be like, it's just my everyday life, but I need to persevere. I need to really follow Jesus, and I'm struggling, and I just need to persevere. I'm going to, we're going to pray, and for those who want to wait upon the Lord, and that's what this song is. You've heard it. We've, we've done it here. I've played this before. We're going to wait upon the Lord. And what does it say? The scriptures say, we, if we wait upon the Lord, he will give us, he will renew our strength, right? And if some of us, we get weak. I'll raise my hand, right? Because sometimes we're trying to do it in our own strength. All right, I got to get through another week. I got to get to another paycheck. I got I to gotta get this through. And, and, and sometimes we need to wait upon the Lord. We need to ask him for that strength to keep persevering, to keep letting those seeds out in our heart and everywhere else. I love that. Therefore, as we have every opportunity, let us do good to all people, right? What happens when you don't feel like it, right? Maybe you've run into someone like that and you're like, and, and, and you hope you have this. Oh, maybe they're having a bad day. You're like, can they be having that many bad days? But we don't want to be the same way, right? Because we have, we can do that, right? And so let's be persevering in the Lord this morning. Will you stand with me this morning? If you need to go, listen, no shame. There's no one going to be shaking you down at the door, making you feel bad. But I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to encourage you to come up to the altar. I'm joining you. We may pray over people. We may not. We're just going to wait upon the Lord. All right? If you know the song and you want to sing it because it's helping you connect to the Lord, sing it. If you just want to spend time with the Lord, again, perseverance is not easy. And we can't do it in our own strength. So, Lord, I just pray this morning that you would give us the ability to wait upon you. And I know, God, that there are people within this room that have big situations that they're waiting upon you for. They're saying, God, I can't do this in my own strength. I'm having trouble following you because A, B, and C, and D, and E are happening. God, you're very aware of it this morning. And I pray, God, that you would renew our strength that we will continue to wait upon you, but that doesn't mean we don't move forward. That means we keep moving forward. We keep doing good. We keep sowing, and we prayerfully are reaping what you want to see in our life. And God, let that verse really ring true in our heart, that we would not grow weary in well-doing. But at that right time, God, we're going to continue to see a harvest happen within our own lives, through this church, in our community, all around us, God. Because your word proclaims it. And this is your goal for us to be the hands and feet of you, Jesus. To be your mouthpieces, to be your examples. You called us as believers to proclaim your, to proclaim your gospel and make disciples. So help us to do it this morning. Help us to persevere in Jesus' name. Amen.